Hi, um, hi Tony, I'm Michael Yonder from the ABC, so sorry for the media getting in early, but that's what we tend to do. <laughs> uh, that's uh, your living, Mike. And another media trait, I'm going to ask you a, a little bit of a double dip question, so I hope that's okay. Uh, the first bit is on the pension changes. Uh, I was just wondering, as someone who is in the Commission lockup, uh, it struck me as I, I know there's arguments around phasing these things in so people can make plans, but surely the biggest pension fiscal problems are actually over the next 15 years with the baby boomer generation and, and so your proposal may not actually do so much to address the fiscal challenges posed by that. And the second question was just on the diesel fuel rebate and what you think about that uh, given that that was probably just outside the scope being more of a tax measure. Okay, um, yeah, on the age pension, look, we recommend, recommended two things. One was on, on including the family home and in, in eventually raising the retirement age. Uh, we did actually, though, recommend a change in the indexation method for, for the uh, age pension, bringing it in line with AWE rather than average male weekly earnings and we recommended that over 15 years. That was an example of our view of equity. How long out do people start preparing for retirement? And we felt that 15 years was about right. That would give people time to adjust how they conduct their business over the next 15 years before there's any change in the way uh, uh, age pension is paid. So, and then in terms of the incremental nature of the change in the indexation, again on that basis of equity, don't give people. If we drop, you know, suddenly overnight, that would be a big shock to the age coterie who are relying on their pension. So that was really a. That's an example of what I would call equity and fairness. And on the the diesel um, uh, fuel rebate, again we thought. Look, if we start going into tax concessions too much, we'll be here forever. We had three and a half months to review $409 billion of expenditure and a, a $1 million budget. So we just really, I, I don't think it would have been efficient or logical to do so. But if we get the expenditure right part right, then we really have fixed up the Commonwealth for a long time. And we did, ex we did also assume that there'd be a return to 24%. Uh, of GDP tax take from the Commonwealth in the next few years. So we did allow for some increase in tax, but we stayed off the diesel fuel and other tax concessions like that. Uh, thanks very much, Tony. Adam Crichton from The Australian. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, a bit about this moral argument that if the government implemented all of your 86 recommendations that the burden of adjustment would fall too heavily on poorer Australians. I basically want to uh, hear what you think of that argument because clearly it's an argument that is of concern to the government and this is and this is apparently what's motivating their desire to perhaps impose an increase in income tax. Uh, it's a very fraught issue I realise but, but I'm just wondering is, that a f is, it, is it fair to say that uh, the burden of your recommendation falls too heavily on the poor? I know you just outlined a few, th a few areas but I'm just hoping that you'll expand further. Look Adam, I, I, I think that's not a fair construction of our report and that says that the people are making that comment haven't properly read it to be to be blunt um, and as I've just explained I've uh, you know we have certainly higher income earners would suffer under our recommendations but again try to do that in an equitable way try to do that over time so I, I think we've I mean the definition between high and low there is a gray area and I agree that that might be where a government might say we've gone a little bit hard or a little a little bit soft even but you know that that definition between who's poor and who's not poor is a hard thing but we certainly have tried to protect the lower 20 percent i mean people came to us and said oh cut the doll well i i think new start in my personal view and i've said it publicly before is still too low but you know that's we've left that as it is but um uh you know we've tried to look after the bottom 20 percent and not adversely impact them. We've tried to make sure that the people who can afford to look after themselves do look after themselves and then the you know there's a grey area in the middle and we've made some calls there and people can judge whether they're fair or not. Uh, Philip Higginson, um, ProNed non-executive director search Taney and probably for total transparency the honorary federal treasurer of the Liberal Party. 
Tony, did you recommend the abolition of the ethanol rebate? Yes, we did. Ago? Would you mind explaining uh, the reasons for that, please? Yes, Philip. Well, look, we again, we looked at all of these industry programs. We, we thought that it was $160 million of taxpayers' money every year. What was the economic and... Uh, if there's any green issues associated with green benefits of it, and we felt that it just wasn't worth it. I mean, we've got to understand this, Phil, Philip, and I think this is something, a fundamental philosophical uh, issue. There is no such thing as government money. There is no such thing as government money. It's our money. It's taxpayers' money. And we have to justify every single cent we spend... And then if we are coming to a stage where we have to cut it and cut it, in this case, by $65 billion a year, we then have to go through on a prioritisation basis and say, well, which ones, are going to, which ones are going to go? And we have to do that on a fairness and an economic basis. And that, that was one which we felt fell out of that, fell over the line into, well, we don't think that's... If we, if we don't do that, well, what are we going to do? Cut the single mum's pension or what? You know, that's the sort of trade you've got to make. And it is hard, and we're not saying it should stop overnight or what have you, and that would be phased in, of course. But we just have to draw the line somewhere, Philip. Well, it's not our call. I mean, we've on all of these, we've said the government itself should make the call and decide on whether it phases it or phases it. it would, well, A, Philip, whether they do it, and as this is a report for government, not by government, and B, if they do decide to do it, the plan for implementation is clearly theirs it, it, on all of these reductions that we suggest. Yep. Um, my name's Stephen Schwartz. Uh, hi, Tony. Thanks very much for that. Um, one of the recommendations that hasn't been mentioned so far is the sale of government-owned enterprises. Um, which is recommended in which I believe um, the number is about $13 billion in equity uh, is tied up in those enterprises and it, it appears to be recommended to be sold. But when it came to the student loan book, which has got a nominal value of about $30 billion and a market value of $20 billion, um, the recommendation is not to sell it. And I'm just wondering if there's some small inconsistency there um, and if whether you'd like to comment on it. Yes, yeah, Stephen, we, did, we had a specific look at that and your numbers are yeah, more or less right, so you're well informed. Um, we felt that the, 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 um, the immediate cash benefit in terms of the reduction in the deficit and debt was not enough to offset the loss that we got from the lower cost of Commonwealth money. So it was just a straight out economic issue. Certainly, and that probably shows that we didn't act ideologically in all of our recommendations as some people have suggested. It seems to me that any responsible organisation, Andrew Cummins, sorry, uh, would sit down and actually do some kind of fundamental review of how they go forward and what they can afford and where the cash flow is going to come from and what sort of stuff we do in any business. Mm. How do you actually now take that work and, 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 and move from what has been almost an inane discussion in the press, specific questions about every little recommendation, and try and actually get a message to the community that they've got to actually to think more holistically about what they do with the economy, how they spend money, so that the message actually gets through and something actually gets done? Mm. Because otherwise you're fighting every little interest group on every little point. Yeah, I, look, Andrew, you do, you, you're, you're right. And we say on about page two of the report, we know inevitably that the vested interest groups will get out and say this is grossly unfair to us and it shouldn't be us and should be somebody else. But I, I think it's up to the, our political leaders to take that up. And, uh, I mean, we're trying our hardest. But, I mean, the answer is quite simple. Um, uh, if, if people are excluded from this, and, and, fa and failing and excluded unfairly from this in many respects, uh, then it, this is just not fair for the whole of society. And I, I've had a, you know, a little bit of reaction to some of them re recently. I've just said, well, you're being greedy. You're really actually being greedy. You, you, you want everybody else to suffer and you to keep your whatever you've got at the present time, and that's just not unfair, and you're being greedy. And I think if our political leaders got out and said that a little bit more openly and honestly, I think you could bring the community with us because Australians actually underneath have a very strong sense of fairness. 
uh, which may overwhelm their sense of entitlement, hopefully. Tony, wonderful report. Uh, not that I can claim to have read it, but um, <laughs> the, issue, the, the issue that comes through most strongly for me is this concept of cons uh, competitive federalism, which I think is extraordinarily interesting and exciting because it's really the biggest structural change in direction that I've seen in many years. Uh, what do you think will be the major obstacles to selling that? Well, uh, you know, there's an inbuilt feeling at the Commonwealth level, and this is a bipartisan comment, and it's a, a, you know, a bureaucratic comment in some respects as well, that Canberra knows best, and we really need Canberra to run everything, and because if Canberra runs everything, everything will be done perfectly, and I don't agree with that. And my fellow commissioners don't agree with that, even though, th uh, well, including myself, four of us were ex-Commonwealth public servants. So I think the biggest Im Im impediment will be at the federal level. And then at some states' levels, there'll be a certain nervousness about, oh, my God, we're fully responsible for our own destiny now. And we can't go back to mission control in Canberra to get support and help when we mess up. Uh, you know, we're standing a lot more on our own. Uh, th th it will be that sort of philosophical issue. I think, or more that and perhaps that uh, yeah, the developed dependency, which will be hard to break. Uh, Tony Ross Cameron, uh, look, my question really goes back to uh, Adam Crichton's, um, where I th I think there's been very widespread welcoming of the robustness of the of the commission and a feeling that you guys have, have made a range of hard calls and sought to spread the pain, etc. But I think there is a question which is perhaps beyond your remit, which is whether the government can bring the budget back to sustainability without breaking more pretty fundamental commitments it made to the electorate on, on other areas. Um, and so this question of breach of, of faith uh, and secondly, um, my question is, with the levy, which is the ugliest face of that breach of faith, I, I think it's not so much, people feel, may feel it's not so much a contest between the rich and the poor, but between the spending patterns of the state and the interests of the citizen. Mm -hmm. And that there's kind of a feeling that maybe this feels like one last uh, drag of the crack pipe by government to, <laughs> you know, put another levy on. Uh, and so can, 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 can we expect governments to give up the crack uh, pot? <laughs> oh, Ross, that was, that was great. Phil, he, Philip Higginson nearly fell over. Um, look, um, they've got, a, they've got a, a simple goal of a 1% of GDP sustainable surplus by 23-24. And they've got two levers they can pull. One is expenditure and one is revenue. They've got to come up, to be believable, they've got to come up with a plan to achieve that by 23-24, pulling either or both levers. And then they've got to stick to that plan. Now, whether that involves breaking alleged promises or not is another thing. But they did make one ironclad promise, and I think it was a fundamental reason why they were elected, was to return the budget to a sustainable surplus. In my view, that trumps all. That trumps all. And I think if they don't do that, then apart from the devastating impact on Australia in the longer term, you know, they will actually suffer a political consequence as a result of that failure. But I think that trumps all. My view is getting to a sustainable surplus is something that the average Australian would like their government to do. David Greatrex, uh, our superannuation is the fourth biggest pot in the world, which means as a part of our economy, it's disproportionately large. There were two issues. I wonder if you could tell us how you thought through them. One is that we're amongst a very small group of countries in the world where you're allowed to take the pot with you when you go. Mostly you can take a little bit and the rest is a pension. And the second is that those people who are fortunate enough to have a lot of money in there, they still don't pay tax 
and whether there's some thought that at some level you should introduce a tax. Okay. Well, David, you're quite right. We've got the fourth biggest pool in the world, and yet we've only got 20% of our people who are, you know, not on an age pension, partial or full. So it's, it's, um, it's the disappointing outcome for a country that's actually instituted a very significant reform in superannuation and a, a great reform in my view, one of the great accomplishments. Um, we had a good look at all of this and that's why we recommended a very strong look at the superannuation tax concessions by the tax review. I mean, that's code for, well, is this really working in terms of encouraging people into superannuation? Because the projections are, even with the increase in the levy, we'll still have 20% uh, uh, covered and 80% and relying on a full or partial pension in, in, in uh, 10 years' time. Uh, this is not something that the Commission looked at. My personal view is that we really need to have a look at how our superannuation schemes are constructed and how do we encourage people on smaller incomes to build up a bigger and more sustainable balance by the time of their retirement. Because I think the average balance at the moment is about 140 grand or something. Well, that's not going to sustain you. You put that away, get an annuity, that is definitely not going to sustain you. How do we get that larger? Now, I noticed Chris Bowen had a comment on that the other day about, well, should we be giving tax concessions, you know, not for the top, but for the bottom? And I actually think that's a good thing to look at. It's how do we encourage people on lower incomes to get a bigger balance when they retire? That makes sense to me. But have a look at the whole thing. I mean, I'm concerned about any more pressure on companies to increase wages effectively by putting more in. I think we are getting to be, that's the other side of the coin, we're getting to be a high wage, low productivity country and we've got to watch that too very carefully. So there's a tension there. But it certainly would be worthwhile having a deep look at how do we encourage lower income people to, inc to increase their superannuation balance on retirement. And the other, getting to your other point about, well, you can only take it as an annuity, you can't take it as a lump sum, we had a look at that. But basically those 20% have such big balances that it's almost not even worth putting in the, the rules to, to cover it. It's not, that is not the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem at the moment is not that people are taking uh, huge lump sums and fritting it away. That really, that's an anecdotal problem. It's not a statistical problem when we had a good look at it, so we didn't recommend it. But if we did go to the stage of encouraging more people and, and, and affecting more people to be in superannuation, then I agree with you. I think that was something you'd need to look at then. But at the moment, it's not a problem. Well, they need to get. I think they. Only, I think they. And I'm included in this, David, as with like you and and uh, John Grill, and we 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 will. You know, we will lose some of those benefits and. So be it. I'm happy to do it. Uh, Tony, um, Cameron O'Reilly from the Energy Retailers Association. I just wanted to ask you in terms of um, uh, the Future Fund and the issue of public service liabilities, have we, did the Future Fund address the issue of unfunded public no, sector I, liabilities I, I, going I, forward? I just, I can't, I can't remember the exact number, but it, I mean, the Future Fund has been a great invention and its growth is welcome and it's been a well-run and well-managed fund, but I think it's, it's hundreds of millions, billions off the unfunded superability level. And when I talk about um, net debt of $440 billion in 2023-24, in that includes the projected balance in the super fund but doesn't include the unfunded super liability. So if you add the unfunded super liability and net debt goes from 17% of GDP to, I don't know, 34, 35% of GDP or something like that. But so it is really, that is a really, that's a sleeper. Um, some of the states have dealt with it, like Victoria, Kennett did it and he cleared that liability and got his state into a, and, and that's one of the reasons uh, Victoria's ridden the storm so well is because they cleared up their balance sheet. And the Commonwealth has not actually addressed that issue yet. Um, Andy Butfield, Tony, unemployed engineer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, your, your recommendations, the Commission's recommendations, when adopted, or what, what are adopted by government, 
What stops a future government reversing those, those adoptions? It's called yeah. democracy, Andy. <laughs> but uh, look, what we're suggesting is some very fundamental fiscal rules which we would hope could get bipartisan support. 24% yeah. of GDP limit on tax, 1% of, uh, of uh, GDP budget surplus, some flexibility around those two, and, and uh, of course, a long-term goal to pay down debt. So some flexibility around those, depending upon the domestic and external economic exigencies. But if both sides of politics signed off on that, the PBO reviewed their plans and their performance against the plan, we would have some protection in the future for not getting out of control again. Uh, hi, uh, Jennifer Hewitt from the Financial Review and at the risk of uh, continuing inane conversation in the media. Um, <laughs> I would... Uh, never inane. <laughs> never inane. Uh, are there are a couple of questions I'd, I'd like. One was you said that the commitment to a budget surplus, sustainable budget surplus over time, trumps everything else uh, in terms of uh, trust or, or, or promises. Um, how would you categorise in that sense the short-term fix to the budget deficit by a increased tax or levy, and is that part, should that, is that part of that commitment as you see it. Um, two, you said that um, New Start, you thought New Start was too low. I don't know if you've seen the ACTU screaming about, about it, uh, you, you recommending a, you know, falling wages for the most uh, vulnerable and unemployed. Uh, did this mean that you lost that discussion uh, in, as part of the willing, willing uh, uh, discussion debate. you had with your colleague and willing <laughs> debate. Um, and three, you, you were very tough on um, on if, if things aren't making measurable progress or, or you can't measure the contribution exactly, then why continue them? And you put things like you know the the, the various export assistance programs and mm. uh, uh, and Australian and innovation in that category. Um, do you think that that's a little too severe uh, in, in terms of trying to actually measure something like that when when the whole emphasis of, um, of our economy is to try and encourage innovation and exports. Okay. Well, let's, you know, three, <laughs> you got your money's worth there. Um, well, let's start with the, the debt tax. Um, well, it certainly wasn't in our remit, and but my feeling on that, my personal feeling on that is a debt tax will have the impact of bringing us back to surplus more quickly which is a good thing because if anything happens in the meantime, it will give us the reserve capacity to, to do something about it and, and nobody really wants to take a, a bet on the externalities facing Australia. But on the other hand, a, a, a debt levy or tax or whatever you want to call it could have an impact on the f a fragile but growing economy, so you'd need to measure it against that. And I would say that um, if the government were to go down that path then, and they were look, looking to implement our recommendations which had an, an immediate impact, they'd need to balance the two of them off. They wouldn't need to do... Well, they wouldn't, I don't think it would be desirable to do both. But fundamentally, that's a call for government. There are advantages, though, I do say, in bringing, the, bringing us back to surplus earlier. But the problem that we have highlighted is one which is longer term and more structural. Oh, now the other questions, yeah. Um, on, the, on the new start allowance, no, I wasn't overridden or what have you there. It was just that we were there to cut expenditure, not increase expenditure. Uh, we felt we kept the new start allowance at, at the existing level. The only change we really made there was to... Uh, encourage younger people under 30s who were single to move into higher employment areas and, and we thought that was fair and reasonable and particularly as they're given a grant to to make the shift so you know if you if you're surfing on the you know the west coast of western australia you know and you can't get a job well perhaps move to perth or somewhere i don't think that's an unreasonable request the best form of welfare for unemployed people particularly young people is a job uh, what was the last one? Uh, uh, the innovation. Look, yeah, look, there's a lot of talk about that, and I'm conscious that John Grill here has done a lot of work in that area, but I think what we're really saying there is it needs to be focused and it needs to be have some measurable outcomes. 
You know, we've all been to Palo Alto and seen how the Americans have gone about it, and they don't really have much in the way of government support in any of that. In fact, I went to the US Business Council with a couple of year or a year and a half ago, and we had a two day meeting, and they didn't mention government once in two days. It was all about how do we help ourselves get on with the job. They just they take government as you know like well it's there and it's a problem we just deal with it but you know we don't rely on them and I think we've got to get a little bit more of that in Australia I think we I think business in Australia's got too much reliant on government all the time every time there's a problem we go to government and I don't think that's healthy in the end I think we've got to learn to stand on our own two feet and like the rest of the community we're saying uh, learn to support yourself I was struck I'll be this one I was struck by the fact that uh, Bob Officer's previous uh, Commission of Audit, none of his recommendations were uh, accepted. Did you keep this in mind when you framed yours to try and make them more uh, politically palatable? Uh, well, I, God, I don't think we're passing the political pal <laughs> palatability <laughs> test at the moment. <laughs> well, look, we were, we did, I read, I, I know Bob Officer quite well and, and, and I know Morris Newman quite well. He was on that, that, that audit and, um, and I did read their report and I thought a lot of what they recommended I'd agree with and some of it we actually picked up certainly on the Federation. So we were mindful of that but we thought, well, We'll give it another go and we'll be as blunt as we possibly can and leave no room for doubt as to what we're recommending and hopefully we can inform the debate and inform the philosophy of government going forward. Yeah. Yes, I thought there was some commonality there, but uh, particularly under the, um, even under the Howard regime, we saw a big increase in welfare payments, family benefits and particularly a massive blowout in disability pensions and we've seen publicity uh, lately about many of these pensioners enjoying the uh, highlights of uh, Bali and, and places yeah, like that. Yeah. What, what did your commission have to uh, well, say we've about this and can, can what, what, what likelihood is that the government will cut back this massively growing area? Well, all, most of our recommendations are directed towards ensuring that those who need support are given it and those who can look after themselves don't and hopefully we cover off on all of those areas that you've mentioned with. On the NDIS we've supported the scheme, we see great advantages in having a national scheme of this sort but we have expressed concern about budget control of it because the Commonwealth, i.e. us, the taxpayer, underwrites the cost of the packages and the level of eligibility and the number of people doing it without any say in it. And I don't think that's particularly democratic or sensible. So we've said, yeah, great scheme, uh, should continue as it is, probably slow down the rollout to make sure we don't make any mistakes, but there should be some budget control over the cost of the scheme. I don't think it's good for the taxpayer's point of view to have a blank check there on the cost of service and the level of eligibility.